All right, our next project is gonna be even better as a warm-up project than the bead and cove stick because we're gonna do an egg. The one thing that's really nice about the egg is it's going to give me a lot of practice making the same cut over and over again. We'll be using our 3-8 spindle gouge to roll the beads. I've got an asymmetrical bead here, and it's really nothing more than that. The problem with an egg is everybody knows what one looks like. Even a chicken knows what an egg should look like. We're gonna use cedar today. The reason for using cedar is I don't have to put a finish on it. You wanna put a finish on it, go ahead, use something else, or you can put finish on your cedar. But that, that, that defeats the point in using the cedar because we want the aromatic scent. If you've got an allergy to cedar, I highly recommend you don't turn the egg out of cedar. And there's really, at the end of this, once you've made a bunch of eggs and warmed up, you do one every day, Couple of weeks later, you got enough to have a nice little bowl full of eggs. And it's a good centerpiece to have in the house. And around Easter time, everybody wants an egg. There's also a lot of collectors of wood and eggs. So if you're trying to sell your work, you've got to cross over from two different uh, interests. The wood collectors and the egg collectors will both buy your eggs if you're in a wood that they haven't got or uh, an egg collector. Well, it's a different egg anyway, so turn a variety of different woods. All right, our finished egg is gonna end up about two inches in diameter. So I want a blank that's a little bit bigger than two inches in diameter. This one's way bigger, it's two and a half inches in diameter. It's four inches long. First thing I'm gonna do, is take my centering gauge or a ruler, whichever you prefer, and I'm going to mark out my centers on this piece. And then take my spring-loaded center punch. And mark my centers. With my centers marked, I'm gonna bring, mount the piece between centers. Again, using my multi-tooth cup center on the drive uh, side and my cup center on the tailstock side. Now the reason I wouldn't want a cone center here is it would drive into that grain and work as a wedge. And I'd always be fighting the tension, It'd never tighten up. The other note I've got is I've got a very small or a very short piece of wood. I don't need a 12 inch tool rest to fight. So I'm gonna to switch to my six inch rest. I'm going to start with my spindle roughing gouge. Check standard tool rest height. With a diameter of two and a half inches, I should be capable with this lathe of running at maximum RPM of 3,000 RPM. Once I get down to 2,000 or to two inches in diameter, even at that max of 3,000, that only puts me at 6,000. When you go back to that uh, mathematical equation of the diameter times the RPM should equal between six and 9,000. Below, I'm at 6,000. Anything slower than that, and I'm not turning fast enough to cut efficiently. As I go to start my lathe, I've set my potentiometer to zero, and I'm going to slowly bring the speed up. Even though this is a big lathe and a small piece of wood, I wanna keep one hand on the machine and feel for vibration. There's about 23, 2400 RPM. I'm gonna start with my spindle roughing gouge, hand underneath the, the tool, Anchor, bevel, cut. Basic ABCs right there, wood turning. Mm. 
Now, as I cut this, I'm cutting on a taper. Right there at the end, you can hear that little knot at the end. I'm getting a pretty good gap between my tool rest and my piece, so I'm gonna bring that in, or my tool rest in a little bit. Now, I've got the taper there. I want a two inch diameter piece when I'm done, so I'm gonna take my caliper and hold it up in my rule, and I've got my caliper set for two and a sixteenth. I'm not fitting on over the piece right there. So I know it needs to be smaller than that. So I'll come back and straighten everything up so that it's all running parallel. Now I'm at the same diameter on everything. I'll continue to taper this end down again. Okay, that fits over the piece. Right about there is my two and a sixteenth. I'm going to leave it just slightly larger than two inches right now because I know as I turn and then sand that last little bit, as I sand it, it'll take it down to my two inch diameter. So I'll square this blank up from here. I am four and an eighth inches long, so I'm going to mark center as a reference point. And then I'm going to mark one and three eighths from the center each way. Decide which side you want to be your long point and your short point. And I like to have my short point towards the headstock and my long point towards the tailstock. And then come from the end of the short point back one and one eighth inches. And that will be the wide point on your egg. This line is just a reference and doesn't mean anything. I'm now going to go to my diamond parting tool. Again, I need to lower the rest. And I'm gonna, I cleaned up that end. I'm gonna do the same thing on this end. That's gonna true up my blank from the saw cuts. It's also going to give me room to work the shape in here as I do this without hitting my centers. I've made that drive center end a little bit smaller than the drive. So it's about the same diameter as I've got on the tailstock end, about five eighths of an inch. Using my three eighths spindle gouge, 
I'm going to start to shape this bead. Again, asymmetrical bead. I'm just going to erase those lines. Those don't mean anything to us. So you can see where the wide point of my egg is. This is the long point. This is the short point. Start with my 3 8 spindle gouge. As I shape this, I'm going to start back with my normal ABCs. Anchor, bevel, cut, and we're going to add D, direction or design. Now as I shape this, I'm very deliberate about how I do things. I didn't start clear back of that black line. I started out on the edge, move that wood. I find my bevel, I shape my tool, my cut. As I come back around, I pull the handle back just a little bit. I keep the bevel intact and gliding on that wood. Now as I come and I do the other side, I'm not going to take that down any smaller yet. As I come to do the other side, my wrist rolls back up underneath. Again, work from comfortable or uncomfortable to comfortable. And so I load my wrist in that uncomfortable position to start the cut. And then I work around. On that last cut, I felt some resistance to the tool. And I believe that's coming from my RPM. I'm not up to speed. I did not increase my speed yet. And so I'm getting the resistance because I'm not cutting efficiently. I'm below that 6,000 mark on that formula of the diameter times the RPM should equal between six and 9,000. So I brought my speed up. And I'm at 25, 2600 RPM here. Now, every time you feel resistance to the tool, it's not necessarily speed usually sharpness. But I know I hadn't brought my speed up and I knew my edge was feeling sharp. And so by bringing the speed up, I can cut clean. I have a little ridge right there. So I came up above that ridge, found my bevel, picked up my cut, and then continued through that ridge. V cuts, using the spindle gouge. Could go you do the skews, the same thing, but this is in my hand. Make that a little smaller. I don't want to part this off at this time, but I want to give myself as much room through here as I can so that I can see the shape develop.
I brought this diameter down to about the thickness of a pencil here. Still plenty strong and plenty durable, um, but, that, and I, but it also gives me enough room to see around the blank and see the shape develop. And I'm ready to sand. As I sand, I'm gonna move my tool rest out of the way and my banjo. I'm gonna start with a 1 -sixth size sheet and then fold that into thirds with the grain. Yes, sandpaper has grain. You can see uh, the structure running lengthwise on there. When I sand, uh, the best part about folding that in thirds is it then doesn't slide on itself. If you fold it in half, the paper slides on itself. Thirds it doesn't. When I sand, I'm going to reduce my speed by about 50%. Your two biggest enemies to sand paper are one, heat. High RPM gives you friction. Friction gives you heat. That breaks down the adhesive that holds the abrasive on the paper. And that's your number two enemy of, of, of abrasives is other abrasives. So as I sand this, I come up from underneath. If I'm over the top, I can't see what I'm doing. Underneath, I can see what I'm doing, and the dust is primarily going away from me. Started with 120 grit. You want to increase by about a 50% jump. This is 180 grit. Before I started this, I drew red lines on the back of my paper. One for 120, two for 180, three for 240, four for 320. If I had 600 grit here, guess how many lines it would have? One squiggly one. I'm way too lazy to count to six, and that's more fingers than this old Turner's got, so I can't get that high. This is 320. That should leave me with a finish that I, it'd be really tough to pick up the scratches. I can see a little dust in there. You can run with the grain at this time, or sanding with the grain at this time. Go around at one quick pass and remove any radial scratches. Now this is with the 320 grit. Any radial lines are perceived as a flaw on a round object. Once I get to this point, this is going to come out of the chuck or out, of the, out from between centers. I'm gonna set this aside for now. And then we're going to go back to a softer piece of wood than what our egg is made out of. Can be green wood, it can be dry wood, it doesn't matter. In fact, I'd prefer green wood because I wouldn't have the dust to deal with, and green wood is typically a little bit stickier than dry wood for this next part. We're gonna make a chuck to hold that egg and remove the center marks from it. And so, again, just, this is a piece of aspen, I don't need to know where exact center is. I got lots of wood. I'm gonna hit and get just a rough center on there. That's not too bad. And the more you practice 
trying to put things in and center them, the better you get or the luckier you get. Every now and again, you get one like that that goes pretty doggone close to running true. I'm gonna start with my spindle roughing gouge. I've still got my grain running between centers, so it's still spindle work. Nothing changed there. Reduce my speed. Hand on the machine, fill vibration. About 23, 2400 RPM. Anchor, bevel, cut, standard tool rest height. I'm just going to bring that piece of wood to a cylinder. Now that I have my blank round, I need to cut a tenon for my four jaw scroll chuck. I'm gonna take my calipers and measure the inside of the jaws across there. Now I like to have about an eighth of an inch opening on each of these jaws here. And that gives me a really good grip because I'm getting full purchase on the chuck jaws. We'll set that aside for now. Bring our tool rest back in. Using my skew, I'm going to cut a dovetail tenon about two inches in diameter and a quarter inch long. First pass, peel cut. Just to true up that end. There's about a quarter inch bite, peel cut. And My calipers have got the ends rounded on them, so they're not really sharp. And I can then check the piece while it's moving with the rounded cal calipers. Once that fits over there, I know I'm to size. Come in and slide down that surface and make sure that everything looks good. You could also use your spindle gouge for that to clean it up. This soft wood needs that step just because I don't want torn fibers. Now that angle looks a little bit sharper than I want on the dovetail. I'm going to nip that back just a little bit, take the sharpness that extreme dovetail off of that in order to fit my jaws better. This piece is now going to go into my scroll chuck, but in order to put my scroll chuck on, I need to remove my drive center. So I'm going to take my knockout bar through the headstock. Don't put your hand over the end of the drive center, but hold on to the sides. If you don't hold on to the sides, the floor will break the fall of the drive center. Doesn't necessarily help it. If your hand's over the end of it, when you hit that, well, you'll figure that one out really quick. Don't ask me how I did. When I put my scroll chuck on, I like to brush the back off and make sure that I've got no dust on this shoulder where it registers up against the spindle. The last little eighth of a turn or so, I give that just a little bit of a flip and that will usually secure that on quite well uh, to the spindle. You'll have to have a wrench to take it off from that point. My scroll chuck 
It's got two key keyways in it. This one happens to use a 10 millimeter hex wrench. Uh, but as I turn either of the keys, all four jaws open and close in unison. So I'll tighten that up. And I tend to do it three times and you pick up a little mechanical advantage each time you do that. I'm not putting a lot of tension on here. I'm not trying to crush the fibers, but I want to take up any of the slack that might be built up in that scroll ring. Before I ch turn the lathe on or go any further, I want to check back in here that there's no gap between the shoulders of that jaw and the piece of wood. The best filler that you can get for this filler gauge is a hundred dollar bill. And if it fits back between those jaws and the wood, you take that hundred dollar bill, you put it in an envelope and save those for your medical down deductible because when these pieces come out, they hurt. Once I've got that in there, again, new mounting, I'm going to reduce my RPM to zero, bring the piece up to speed. First thing I wanna do here is true this surface up. It's running very close to being true, but it's not dead true. And I wanna be perfectly true. So it's simple skim cut here. Trues that surface up. Once I have this true to a cylinder, I'm gonna come around and true up the end. Now I've brought my tool rest around. I've set it standard tool rest height for my 3 8 spindle gouge. I come up with the handle level, the flute closed, and the tip of that tool should enter the side of that blank. If you've got your handle down and try to enter, the lower wing is what's making contact first and it wants to skate that direction. Once I'm in on and have a bevel on the wood, I can drop the handle an arc to center. I've marked center so that we can see that clearly. Our next step is going to be remove my tailstock center and slide my tailstock out of the way. I need the room here and I don't want the mark of a wood turner. That's the scar on the back of your hand. You got mine right there where you've hit that uh, point on your revolving center. Using my 3 8 spindle gouge the entry on this can be just a little bit tricky, but if you follow the instructions, it'll come, it'll work just fine. As I hollow end grain, I'm going to have the flute of my tool pointing over between nine o'clock and 10 o'clock. If I had the hand of a clock coming out of that flute, I'm going to start behind and below center and I can feel right now my rest is a touch high. So I'm gonna lower my rest just a little bit. And I'm probably going to be just barely below standard tool rest height for this cut. I'm gonna start behind and below center. So I'm actually coming in between four and five o'clock. The radius on the tip of the tool is about an eighth of an inch behind that center point. And as I push, the bevel point pushes the tool into the center line. Once I start to feel a little vibration, I can come up 
off of the rest. And I felt a little vibration. I stopped, I opened that up just a little bit further and I want to get that entire wing of that tool inside the wood. And I can bring my handle up and my tool up to where I'm running parallel to the axis of the lathe. And that gouge will work just like a drill bit. For this project, I'm gonna drill a hole all the way through the blank. I may need that later, I may not, but I've got the option now that I to, to use it if I do. That's gonna heat this tool up very quickly, so be careful, don't grab that right off the bat, give it a chance to cool, dip it in some water if you've got it handy. And now I'm gonna to start to open this up using the bottom wing of the gouge. Smaller, I want the hole and the opening smaller than the diameter of the egg. As I continue to open this up and I get deeper and wider, I get this annoying sound. That is the gouge letting me know it's being abused and it doesn't like what we're doing here. So don't continue on with that. That's just flexing that tool and making that terrible chatter. It's time to change tools. The tool we're going to change to is going to be our box scraper. Since I'm using a scraper, my tool rest needs to come up. Anytime you're using a scraper, you want the handle in what's called a trailing motion. So it's a downward motion. If you've got that handle down, with a scraper and this piece of wood bites a hold of it and gets a good grab, you've got to go through center, which makes it go deeper in order for it to release. That's where your violent catches with the scrapers are going to happen. I want to be above center when I'm at the back of the hole. And so that should give me what I need right there. I've got that trailing motion, trailing action on the handle. I'm gently entering in there, and as soon as I feel the resistance starting to pick up because of the width of the cut, I'm gonna move over towards the center. And get a little bit more depth. Here's a cross section of what we're building. And I've got a very shallow taper on this piece. You can see that has been drawn in there. And I want to take my egg and fit it in there and have it grab my egg. That will enable me to remove the ends off of this egg. And that's why this is called a jam chuck is because the egg is literally gonna be jammed into that chuck. I can see right there, I need to open that up just a little bit more. It's just shy of being the right diameter, but I wanna be a little bit more. It'll grab maybe on the long point, but it won't hold it really well, and it won't really hold the short point at all. You notice that taper? I'm going in here on the taper. The taper works as an escape route. I could hold this on a cylinder if I got the right size drill bit and everything was perfect, but the taper allows me to use different size fits. And if I completely miss it, I can shorten up the length of the chuck and work down and keep and make a smaller opening. So I need to open this up just a tiny bit. Remember everything I take off of one side, it takes equal amount of the other. So it's double the size cut. I wanna be very careful on that cut and I'm cutting a taper towards the back, very shallow, but I can close one eye, look down past the blade and line it up with the bed and see that I've got a taper or 
going on. Could use another pass. I'm feeling what's going on back in that hole. I'm not looking down there to see what's going on. The reason is that handle needs to be high. If I look down in, I'm gonna drop the handle. Then it's gonna catch, lift the handle, and occupy the same space that my head is. Okay, that's about the right size, but I'm bottoming out on inside. So I need to get a little bit more depth in that hole. I'm hitting the ridge that I've left in there. And if you notice, I've got my arm, my hand towards the front of the handle and the length of the handle is tucked up underneath my arm. That way it's got to move all of my body mass out of the way before it can actually hit me in the head with the handle. So I took the one ridge I had out of there and then I've gone and got a little bit more depth in the center just in case I need more room for the ends on that piece. Sawdust will throw you out of center and it also is like trying to set this on ball bearings. It won't hold. Okay, that looks like it's where I want to be fit wise. I'm going to bring my tail stock up, put my center back in. Always wipe the dust off of your centers before you put them into your Morse tapers. I can now use the revolving center to help seat that and keep it running true. And then it also works as a great escape uh, assistant to keep that from popping out and flying across the floor. I have my tailstock just slightly backed off. It's not turning, but it'll give me a good indication on if I've got a good enough hold here on my jam chuck. Rest seems to be just a little high. So I'm gonna lower that rest. I'm just slightly below standard tool rest height here and that gives me a nice shear angle on that tip rather than coming in flat and pushing in. I'm gonna practice out my cuts out here on this surface and you can hear that's just a touch loose. That's what I'm talking about, I can seat it back in. I'm not trying to put so much pressure on with that tailstock that I make this hard to get out of the chuck. You want to practice these cuts through here so that you can come in, get on that surface, pick up the cut, and make that without coming in and getting the catch and spiraling up your blank.
little cuts. And I'm watching that revolving center. I'm not touching it, it's close, but I'm not touching it. So I'm thinking I've got a good secure hold on this blank now. Now I've separated that just long of the egg. And the reasoning for that is I don't, when that piece broke off, it could have pulled fibers out of the end. And I don't want them, those to be pulled out of the end of the, the blank. Move my tailstock out of the way. I'm going back through the same set of abrasives. That I used before 120. 180. Two forty. Three twenty. Now it's also important to note, I'm not holding at the wide point of this egg. I'm my wide point is out in here. I'm holding behind that, so I've got access past the wide point of the egg with my sandpaper right now. And when I turn it around, I should have access back again to where I can finish everything off. A little push sideways, generally is all it takes to get those to loosen up. If you've got that jammed in there really good and tight and just you can't get the traction on your hand to get it sideways, you coat your hand with a little bit of tongue oil and that gives you a little traction or a cabinet liner, a little piece of cabinet liner helps, a little rubber mat. Practicing those cuts again, getting rid of that waste. The tail stock's backed off just a little bit. And so I know I'm secure. I'm not relying on the tail stock to hold that egg in place. Got that last little bit, felt some resistance. I tried to wait for it and it didn't want to cut clean through. I ended up pushing a little heavy and I tore those fibers out that I tried so hard to keep from popping out. So I'm going to come back in a little higher, pick up a cut. and get up underneath those torn fibers. But if you noticed on that cut, just before I broke that off, I set at that last little bit and tried to let that tool do its job. Wait for it to cut, don't get too big of a hurry.
same set of abrasives, 120, 180, Two forty three twenty I may have picked up just a little burnish line when that set down in. I'm gonna sand that burnish line back. Again, you could sand that with the grain if you wanted. I've got my egg, and it doesn't go back into that bowl yet that's got all the other eggs in it because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. The chuck, you're going to take this piece, and you can save it, if, especially if it's dry wood, and then the next time you do an egg, you could go ahead and just true up the inside a little bit if your opening's a little tight or a little big, you cut down the face and work down on there. But as long, you can turn moldable eggs to the point to where you've got just the ends on them and then make a chuck and work through a bunch of them at once. And there's your eggs.